before we start, I just want to <clears throat> um, say a few words about Vicky, uh, who I've been working with for the last few years. She took over after um, John Johnson and I uh, was asked by AFL to continue the neurosarcoidosis clinic. This is a joint clinic with both neurology and sarcoidosis expertise. And I think um, it is, uh, um, we have all understood in the sarcoidosis team that Vic is our rising new neurosarcoidosis star. So we, she's always supportive of us. And uh, thank you very much, Vicky, uh, for all your hard work. Over to you. Thank you, Vasilis, for that lovely introduction. Um, but it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kidd, who is a consultant um, neurologist at the Royal Free Hospital. He is a renowned expert in several neuroinflammatory conditions, including neurosarcoidosis. And he's established a neurosarcoidosis unit at the Royal Free Hospital, which is involved in research and seeing and treating patients across the country. However, before I hand over to Dr. Kidd, um, I think I need to ask Avril um, to share her video. Avril Lawless. Um, 2018, I started having a few unusual problems suddenly start happening. It started off that my speech was getting very um, slurry, but I couldn't hear it at all. It was only that my husband told me about it. <clears throat> And then shortly after that, I started getting major migraines that would last for two weeks at a time. There was nothing I could do to, um, you know, get rid of it. I just had to go into a dark room and try and fall asleep. And that was happening constantly. And shortly after that, I started getting very unsteady on my feet and it looked like I was drunk. And all these things just started one after another. And then the last thing that happened was I went deaf. I just went progressively deaf to a point where I could hardly hear anything at all. Um, around about the same time, my mother had had a stroke and I was going backwards and forwards to Birmingham where she lived. And I just thought that it was maybe I was just getting tired of going backwards and forward and this was causing all these things to happen. Um, so I, kind of just ignored it. Then at the end of January 2019, I was at home and I had, I was just unresponsive and just wasn't speaking. I was just in a total blank, in a blank stare. So my husband called an ambulance. I was first taken to Croydon University Hospital <clears throat> and they did a CT scan and they found out that I had a mini stroke and a blocked vessel to the brain. So I was then transferred to St. George's and they found out I had neurosarcoidosis. They kept me in there for two weeks and they just continued to um, help me back to speech and being able to talk and everything. I was transferred to Charing Cross. I was given a regimen of drugs. Um, lumbar punctures, etc., to find out, you know, what, what could be done. After I was discharged, I was monitored and put on methotrexate. After a while, it was felt I should go on a drug called infliximab, which was going to be put in by infusion every eight weeks. I still suffer with migraines a, a, a few weeks before I am on the um, infusion. After the, I left the hospital, I had to work with an occupational therapist to deal with my short-term memory loss. Also, sometimes I cannot process the correct words due to memory loss. But all in all, I think, you know, I am now stable and um, I'm just grateful for all the help I get from Charing Cross because, you know, if I hadn't been sent there, who knows what might have happened. So, you know, all in all, um, at the moment, I'm in a stable position. If it wasn't for my husband being there, taking time off work to look after me, um, I wouldn't. I, it wouldn't have been possible to do it. It was. It, it was just such a hard process. Thank you so much, Avril, um, for that lovely summary of, of your experiences.
Um, I'll hand over to Dr Kidd now. Thank you very much, Vicky, and thank you, Vasilis, for asking me to talk. Uh, and I'm, I was very interested in, in Avril's um, 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 story, a uh, very um, um, characteristic of a, a, a particularly severe form of the condition. What I want to do is, um, uh, whenever I'm talking about, um, uh, oh dear, uh, whenever I'm talking about um, uh, the, um, uh, the conditions that we deal with, um, there it is, um, that it's not always as severe as, uh, as it uh, can be, uh, but um, it, thankfully uh, with the right kinds of treatments, um, uh, things usually settle down quite well. Uh, so I'm going to give a quick overview of uh, the condition. Um, uh, I'm not going to give my normal introduction that's been given beautifully by uh, the previous uh, lectures and I've enjoyed listening to uh, all of them uh, this morning. Um, whenever it affects the brain, uh, about 5%, maybe 8% of people with uh, systemic sarcoidosis uh, develop neurological complications. Um, more than that, maybe 50% would develop neurological symptoms uh, alongside the beginning of the disease, which I'll come back to if I have uh, time at the end, um, which don't uh, reflect uh, neurological involvement, but are, are all part of the um, uh, the inflammatory uh, disease before it settles down with treatment. Overall, um, patients with uh, what is called neurosarcoidosis, which just means that the nervous system is affected by the condition, 50% have very minor uh, abnormalities, which usually settle down very nicely with the treatment of the underlying disease. Uh, these are cranial neuropathies of which uh, a facial nerve palsy, a so-called Bell's palsy, uh, is the most common. It would affect 50% of those. 50% of those would have it on both sides, which is much less common than a regular uh, Bell's palsy. It doesn't always get completely better, uh, but most people do recover very nicely. And then that is the end of the neurosarcoidosis story for those people. It's most uncommon, provided the disease remains well treated and monitored carefully uh, for a neurological involvement to develop. If again, if it has gone, uh, gone away after a simple matter, uh, such as a cranial neuropathy. There are always exceptions. 30% of people would have it involved in the brain, and I'll be talking about that most of all. 5% is the, is the number given uh, for people in whom it involves the spinal cord or the lower part of the spine called the cord equina. My view is that it's much higher than this, and I think it's, it's more uh, about 20% um, um, uh, of uh, cases. In fact, I see a lot of people who have uh, um, involvement of the spinal cord. Peripheral neuropathy is not usually a big deal, and I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, thankfully not uh, usually a big deal, but it does sometimes require its own uh, specific uh, form of treatment. Uh, and involvement of the muscle is complicated, not very well understood, uh, often uh, uh, not recognised, um, uh, and also difficult uh, to treat. So if we talk about cranial neuropathy, first of all, I'm just going to run through the list basically over the next 10 minutes or so before moving on to the investigations and treatment. I think I've said some of this already. 50% of all cases simply have uh, an involvement of one, occasionally more nerves. Uh, which arise from the brain, hence uh, the term cranial neuropathy. Uh, so any of them could be affected. The facial nerve is the seventh, uh, and it affects the muscles of the face. The trigeminal nerve is the fifth, and that would cause numbness, which is quite common, which sometimes causes a burning feeling as well. Um, and it can also affect uh, the sense of smell and taste, uh, vision. Um, and then some people can get... Um, uh, uh, problems with hearing, as Alvary, uh, Avril mentioned, although it sounds like her condition is more widespread than just affecting um, hearing. Uh, and then others uh, can get what Avril also um, uh, showed, which was a hoarseness of the voice uh, as well, sometimes with difficulty swallowing uh, and difficulty with, uh, with chewing their food. <laughs> 
If the MRI scan is normal, and about 70% of cases um, uh, the MRI scans are normal, uh, then the condition tends to settle well with treatment. And like I've said already, it tends not to be a severe or worrying kind of problem. The spinal fluid, if it's checked, um, under these circumstances is usually more likely uh, to be abnormal than the MRI scan is abnormal. Um, and But only uh, mild uh, um, features are seen, and I'm coming on to talking about the spinal fluid later on. 80% of people recover completely uh, with um, institution of, of treatment. Some get better on their own, as, um, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, a lot of patients with sarcoidosis uh, uh, can recover spontaneously. Uh, but most people do require um, the addition of steroids in order to settle uh, the cranial neuropathy more quickly uh, and uh, more completely. These are more severe examples. Uh, you're going to see a lot of brain scans, but people often find it kind of fun. Um, uh, this is the seventh nerve, which is at the back of the brain uh, um, uh, on the um, uh, left-hand uh, side. Uh, this is the third nerve, which is a nerve which passes into the eye and makes the eye move. So people with a third nerve problem would develop um, a double vision, for example. Sometimes they would lose their um, uh, their uh, eyelid function as well, and so the eye would uh, would close. These are more severe examples. As I've said already, um, uh, only 30% of people have abnormal MRI scans with this kind of problem. Optic neuropathy is often more severe. I know that Mr. Petrushkin is going to be talking about optic, uh, uh, about ocular involvement, uh, I think after me. Um, uh, it's not a common feature, um, but it is a little bit more complicated than other uh, forms of cranial neuropathy. Um, and it often uh, reflects more severe, more widespread uh, uh, neurological involvement as well. 80% have um, uh, a subacute onset, which we call an optic neuritis, because it looks very similar to the kind of optic neuritis that patients with, uh, for example, multiple sclerosis would get. Um, uh, but there are, there are different uh, aspects to it uh, when it's compared with people who've got um, uh, that kind of condition. Uh, again, it can be a bilateral more often than, uh, than it might be with other causes. Um, and um, in the majority, um, uh, only the uh, eye can be affected. But it's very important that scans are undertaken because unrecognized, more widespread, severe neurological involvement can be seen on the scan. Uh, a feature um, is uh, that um, uh, it can be a relapsing condition. We usually have to give steroids in order to make it better. As the dose of steroids comes down, uh, the condition can deteriorate, requiring the steroids to go up. And you can sometimes have this yo-yo effect where you put the steroids down, the disease gets worse. You put the steroids up, the disease gets better. You put the steroids down, the disease gets worse again. And that's often a sign that uh, more complicated long long-term treatments are required. Um, if uh, uh, patients have abnormal um, uh, uh, MRI scans of the brain showing a compressive optic neuropathy, so the orbital apex, for example, the condition unfortunately tends not to improve despite uh, treatment. These are examples. Uh, uh, this is um, what an optic nerve light looks like on a normal scan. This is the right side and this is the left side. You'll notice that the left side is swollen uh, and it's much harder to see the difference between the nerve and the fluid around the nerve within the optic nerve sheath. This is the same patient and you can see that there is inflammation of the optic nerve uh, around about uh, a third of the extent of the, um, uh, of the nerve. And this patient had no sight in the left eye uh, until treatment was given, but thankfully her sight is now absolutely back to normal and it has remained normal uh, indeed for many years. These are more severe uh, examples. Um, uh, this is the example I've mentioned about having more widespread inflammation with the, the brain. This is uh, the lining of the brain called the dura, and so this is what's called a pachy meningitis, which I'll be talking about in a moment or two, which can extend uh, and be quite widespread. Uh, and whenever it affects the nerve, uh, the, uh, you can lose some sight on that side. And this is a much more um, uh, focal area in the area known as the orbital apex uh, um, and this patient presented uh, only with a gradual worsening disturbance of vision which despite treatment unfortunately did not improve. <laughs> 
So the next thing to talk about is involvement of the pituitary gland and hypothalamus. This, these often cause rather silent symptoms. You don't always uh, realize that you've got uh, uh, disturbances of your pituitary gland function. Um, and it can be very striking on the scan. So this is the pituitary gland here uh, in the center of the uh, brain at, uh, at its base. Um, and it's about um, five or six times its normal size. Uh, and patients usually lose hormonal functions. Women would lose their menstrual cycle, for example. People inevitably develop a, a very profound sense of tiredness. Their blood pressure often goes down if their um, steroid levels uh, are reduce. Uh, they can develop uh, problems with thyroid function as well. Um, and then if the, um, uh, the back part of the pituitary gland um, causing, um, um, uh, which looks after uh, um, uh, thirst and your uh, regulation of um, a fluid uh, function in the body, you can get a condition called diabetes insipidus, uh, which can cause uh, profound thirst and profound what we call polyuria. So you pass out a lot of urine, you can never concentrate your, uh, your urine and you end up very, um, uh, very dehydrated. It can be associated uh, with, um, uh, with an involvement only of the gland itself and not elsewhere, but it can also be associated with, with more widespread inflammation. In treatment, um, uh, the pituitary function tends not to recover, but endocrinologists are very skilled nowadays at um, uh, restoring pituitary function uh, using um, um, uh, artificial uh, hormone preparations, for example. Uh, women uh, without uh, menstrual cycles can undergo successful pregnancies, for example, um, uh, even if the pituitary function is not working. So these are examples then, uh, you can see that the pituitary gland is not necessarily large, but the area of the brain behind the pituitary stalk, and this part of the brain called the hypothalamus, uh, is uh, quite profoundly affected. Here's someone in whom the pituitary gland has um, uh, atrophied or shriveled up, um, uh, uh, leading to a loss of function, and there's still abnormalities of the pituitary stalk as well. And then other cases in which well, you can't see it, but you'll have to believe me that the pituitary gland itself was okay, but the hypothalamus itself and the base of the brain around this area called the third ventricle was very profoundly affected. So pachymeningitis, um, uh, this is uh, an inflammation of the brain um, uh, which affects the lining of the brain called the dura mater. Uh, it, this um, it is separate from the brain and is outside the brain and separated from the brain by uh, um, uh, the leptomeninges, which we'll be talking about in a minute. Uh, and in the most cases, um, involvement of the lining of the brain presses on the brain, but doesn't get inside the brain. So the brain itself is not necessarily damaged by this process. Patients present uh, with the effects of the, um, uh, of the area. So pressing here, for example, might cause some numbness or, or a weakness. Uh, pressing here, uh, as I've said already, can cause problems with optic nerve function. Uh, here, there is an enlargement of the area known as the cavernous sinus through which uh, the nerves which end up in the eye um, uh, pass, so you get double vision, uh, difficulty with um, uh, uh, optic nerve function, and sometimes numbness in the face. And then here you can see there's an enlargement of the lining of the brain, which can cause problems with vision uh, and with, uh, with balance as well. Um, seizures can arise, uh, focal signs are what I've described. Headache is virtually um, a universal in this um, uh, condition. And then as it improves, we use headache uh, as a sign uh, that uh, the condition is, uh, is improving and regressing. It tends to be indolent and progressive. So in other words, the story is very long before the diagnosis is made. Uh, it's often very diffuse, but it can be nodular as I've shown you on the previous set of slides. Headache is very, um, uh, universal. There are fewer neurological signs and it can be um, uh, focal, but it can also be very widespread as I've shown you on the, on the slides. We'll talk about the treatment in a moment. Leptomeningitis is the, um, uh, the very worrying uh, feature of neurosarcoidosis, uh, which affects around about 20% um, of people who have sar uh, neurosarcoidosis. It is aggressive, uh, it is destructive, 
um, and uh, it causes um, uh, severe uh, problems uh, which are not remediable um, if there is a delay uh, before treatment is given. So patients pretend, uh, de uh, develop a headache first, drowsiness, which can sometimes become exceedingly severe. People can even be comatose uh, uh, and certainly delirious. And you get what we call spreading neurological signs. So rather like Avril was explaining with in her um, uh, very informative story, uh, you start over one set of symptoms and then over um, several days, sometimes several weeks, a new thing happens each day. It sometimes fluctuates and, and you wonder what on earth, where, where on earth this problem is going to end. Uh, this is more for the, 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 the doctor's uh, kind of um, um, uh, lecture. Uh, but uh, so the diaconphalic region uh, looks after um, memory, uh, the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus, as, as, as I've mentioned already. Um, uh, and um, uh, the brainstem is more um, uh, towards the, uh, the back of the brain, uh, um, which looks after autonomic functions and uh, vision and balance and things like that. Generally, uh, around about half of the patients have the diaconphalic um, uh, version and another half have the brainstem version. And both of these are in the base of the brain and the, and the base of the brain gets inflamed and it spreads upwards uh, into the brain. Uh, when the lining of the brain is affected, you can develop uh, an increase in pressure, which can be exceedingly severe and life-threatening. And this is called hydrocephalus. This is an example of uh, a rather severe uh, form of the condition uh, where uh, in the frontal regions of the brain on both sides, there is a lot of swelling and inflammation. You can see it here coming from the lining of the brain, spreading inwards to the brain, causing the swelling that we can see here. Uh, and this is a, a neurological emergency. This is another series of examples as well. It can be quite widespread. This is more this kind of brainstem and posterior aspect. You can see that the cerebellum is very inflamed. And again, you notice that it comes from the lining of the brain, the meninges. This is why we call it a meningitis and it spreads inwards from the lining of the brain. You can see it very nicely here, spreading inwards around the, uh, the area known as the sulcus, which is the, the uh, space fluid fill space in between lobes of the brain. You can see it here and here. All of this is abnormal. Notice that this side of the brain is completely normal. This side of the cerebellum is not. Uh, and you can see that there's pressure. You'll have to believe me that um, uh, the, the, uh, the ventricle that we see here, uh, we should normally uh, be visible here, but it's all squashed up. And this is another example showing it rather nicely that the whole of the cerebellum is affected. The brainstem is also affected here. You can see that there are areas of inflammation here and also here. So the whole of the brain can be affected and indeed it can even spread into the spinal cord as we'll discuss in a moment. These are just more examples as well, um, uh, which, which show it nicely. You can see here, for example, it, in the lining of the brain, this part of the, um, uh, the ventricular system is, is abnormal, um, uh, leading to the condition, not so very severe in this case, but it, it uh, has led to the condition called hydrocephalus, which you can also see here. This is caused by inflammation spreading into the lining of the brain. Do you see these little nodules here? And you can see that this, the lining of the brain, the ependymal lining is bright. You can also see a leptomeningitis spreading in from the surface of the brain to the lining of the brain of, of the ventricle on both sides. This is a rather old fashioned scan, but it just shows that it, uh, if left untreated, it, become, it can become exceedingly severe. Desmond, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I'll hurry up, I promise. I, normally <laughs> this takes me an hour. <laughs> So we've got a little bit of time for questions. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'll rush over this. Uh, the pachymeningitis tends to affect people in a less severe way. The leptomeningitis, as I've said, uh, affects people in a much more severe way. The spinal cord can be exceedingly um, severely affected. Uh, there are various different forms. It's more often a leptomeningeal than a pachymeningeal. It can be um, very slowly progressive. Uh, it can also be quite mild. And a lot of patients mention they get a, a burning, uh, unpleasant feeling either on one side or both sides of the chest. And that's the only involvement that they can, they can have sometimes. It tends to go with steroids, but can, uh, can um, uh, 
um, get um, uh, it can um, uh, resolve with steroids as well. This is an example of how the spinal cord and the cord equina can be affected. All of these bright areas um, uh, are um, uh, areas of inflammation. They tend to hang on the nerve roots and they develop as nodules as well. And you can see there are lots of nodules. Patients like this would have numbness in the legs, disturbances of bladder and bowel function, difficulty walking, for example. Unfortunately, I'll have to pass over the vascular involvement. I think it's an exceedingly important. Avril mentioned having the wondered if she'd had a stroke or not. Uh, most often, patients with inflammation in the brain feel that they've had strokes, but they don't. Uh, but uh, other patients can have strokes whenever the blood vessels are involved. These are two examples. This is an inflamed blood vessel. Uh, as well. Uh, and in fact, we're seeing this more and more uh, and uh, we're, we're actually collecting a, a series together to, to publish because it does need to be recognised uh, as a more um, a severe aspect of the condition. It can sometimes even cause brain uh, hemorrhage if, um, if um, uh, uh, the blood vessel um, integrity is breached by the inflammation as well. And you can see this um, here these are granulomas within the brain uh, that uh, Dr. Hart was talking about. You can see uh, the blood vessel breached and then uh, blood actually passes out. You can see another example there. We can't talk about that when we can't talk about spinal fluid. It just shows that it's not necessarily terribly active, but the more severe the disease is, the more severe the abnormalities that we see in the spinal cord are. This is more for the doctors. Uh, it's very important to realize that it's exceedingly uncommon. Uh, I would say it never happens uh, for the condition known as oligotonal bands to arise, which is a, an important um, uh, condition. And I was sorry not that I, I've missed up uh, talking about this. The, the neuropathy is not usually very severe. It can be sometimes, uh, you can get the mononeuritis multiplex, uh, but it tends uh, uh, to be quiet and uh, gradual, and it tends to stabilize with treatment, although it doesn't usually get better. Small fiber neuropathy is a very unpleasant burning feeling, uh, which is not associated with, uh, with neurological involvement itself, uh, but is um, a, a, a harbinger of the inflammatory disease. So if you, if you treat the inflammatory disease, uh, then the symptoms of the small fiber neuropathy tend to settle down. It can be so severe as to require um, treatment with infliximab, for example. So I've not too much to say about this. I just wanted to say uh, that um, uh, all of these treatments have been discussed already. The, the difference uh, between your, a treatment of neurological disease um, and a treatment of respiratory disease, for example, is that it tends to be an emergency, uh, particularly if you have leptomeningeal involvement. Um, and we quite often use all three uh, methods of uh, treatment straight off uh, from, uh, from diagnosis. You don't have to mess around saying, well, let's see if methotrexate works or not, um, uh, whenever you know perfectly well uh, that they're going to need infliximab and infliximab works very well. It restores neurological function provided it hasn't been lost forever. Um, uh, and if you leave it six months, even three months before you start using these treatments, uh, then um, 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 the, um, uh, uh, the condition can become irreparable. We're licensed in the health service in England for your infliximab. Adalimumab works, but we're not allowed to use it despite my uh, efforts to persuade the uh, powers that be. Um, I, I think this has been mentioned already. Other forms of TNF alpha will take tend not to work in sarcoid. Rituximab uh, works well. I think I've spelled that wrong. It doesn't look right. Um, and then we think that a new uh, anti rheumatic drugs like genus kinase inhibitors will work well for severe forms of the condition as well. I was hoping to talk about this at the end, really, but I think I was very pleased that um, uh, uh, the other doctors um, have talked about this. Access to a specialist centre, communication between specialists, it drives me mad uh, that there is not as much as there should be. Places like the Royal Brompton and in Birmingham, I know, uh, have, in fact, also Newcastle, for example, have very good centres where they, the, um, uh, the specialists do communicate very well. 
um, and um, uh, the, the importance of understanding that um, there needs to be community and family support in dealing with long-term diseases is exceedingly important as well. I'm so sorry for uh, talking for too long and thank you very much. Thank you, Desmond, for an absolutely wonderful talk. And I'm so sorry that we had to cut you off slightly early. <laughs> <laughs> I always talk for too long. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go to Avril first of all, just to see if she has any patient questions. And I also see one of our other patients, Joanne, is, is on standby too. But I'm going to go to Avril first, if she's there. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes you can. Okay. Um, the first question is, is it possible to have significant, significant neurosarcoidosis that is undetected on MRI, um, on an MRI scan? Uh, so the answer is yes, uh, uh, but. Um, so it, whenever it affects the brain, if it is, is significant, as you say, so in other words, if it's obvious uh, that um, a, a large portion of the brain is not functioning well, uh, then um, well over 90% of cases would have an abnormal brain scan. Now, I have uh, um, um, three patients um, in whom uh, their brain scans have been normal right the way through, uh, and we've had to take a biopsy of their brain in order to confirm uh, that the sarcoid was there. We call it a, a thing called cortical granulomatosis, and we don't fully understand why um, uh, it doesn't, um, it, it differs uh, to other patients uh, in whom it um, uh, is visible on the scans. One of the reasons is that the process generates less inflammation. And what we see on the scans, as I've been showing, is, is um, a kind of water uh, on the, um, around the areas of inflammation. That's what an MRI scan looks like. Um, if there's water in the brain, which is caused by the inflammation, then it shows up on the scans. Some people can develop a very severe form of the condition which, in which the granulomas develop, but you don't necessarily excite a, um, an inflammation within the brain. And so they don't always show up. I have a very nice example of a man who um, was, was sent to see me uh, unconscious. Nobody knew uh, what was going on. They said, well, yeah, he's got, he's got sarcoid. It's in the lungs, but it's not really too bad. Um, uh, and uh, we did a whole bunch of tests. The spinal fluid was abnormal, which was helpful. We were looking for infections as well. We took a biopsy of his brain uh, and he had um, very classical signs of sarcoidosis. We gave him treatment and thank God he is um, uh, walking, talking, back at work, feeling much better, not completely uh, better, but um, uh, he, did, uh, he did improve very nicely. So the answer is that it does um, uh, show up uh, in most cases, uh, but it doesn't always um, uh, show up. Okay, the next one is, um, I have a really tight feeling around my upper torso, ribs, chest and back. I have just been diagnosed with neurosarcoidosis. Is this feeling normal? <clears throat> So uh, yeah, the, I mentioned this very briefly. So this is this uh, thoracic radiculopathy, which doesn't always show up on a, on a scan of the spinal cord. And it's a burning feeling. It's usually kind of mid chest. It's often on both sides. Um, and um, uh, the skin, if you touch the skin, it feels kind of raw and uncomfortable. And it's quite a common manifestation. And uh, this, this patient has been diagnosed with neurosarcoidosis. Uh, it, it may be that, that he or she has other features Features as well. So there may be more widespread involvement of the spinal cord. Um, it, it could, of course, be elsewhere in the nervous system as well. But it is one of the features. And I think I mentioned already that some people have that as the only feature of their condition as well. If you do very special high definition scans, you can see that the nerve roots are bright on the and swollen, um, uh, uh, particularly if you give a contrast agent on the scan. If you do fancy physiological tests, you can spot uh, that it's coming from the nerve roots. So we know exactly what causes that. And it usually settles with treatment, uh, but you can be left with a burning feeling, um, which is less severe than at the beginning in the long term. Okay, this is <clears throat> quite a long one. Can patients have sarcoidosis and neurosarcoidosis at the same time? I have been diagnosed with sarcoidosis, sample taken from lymph nodes, but wonder if I may also have or have had neurosarcoidosis. 
I know sarcoidosis is rare and neurosarcoidosis even more so, but how rare is it for a sufferer of sarcoidosis to also have neurosarcoidosis? Well, some would say uh, that you cannot have neurosarcoidosis unless you have systemic sarcoidosis as well. Now, I haven't had time to talk about this. There, there is um, a condition called isolated neurosarcoidosis, which I think is exceedingly rare. It's not 10% of patients as, as uh, other uh, people um, uh, have implied in, in previous um, uh, papers. Um, uh, and the difficulty is, and again, this is, uh, this, if I had time, I'd I talk about it, but I'll just rush over quickly. The difficulty is that you can get inflammation which looks like sarcoidosis in the brain caused by other conditions, including infections and tumors and conditions like vasculitis um, and, um, and things like that. Um, and so um, uh, the answer is uh, that um, uh, almost everybody, so that would be over 98% of people who have neurosarcoidosis also have systemic sarcoidosis. Now, if you treat neurosarcoidosis, uh, and as, I, as I quickly implied, we often give much more extensive and strong treatments to clear the neurological involvement. The systemic features often settle down quite well. So I often find uh, whenever I'm uh, helping to keep a check on, on people's lungs with treatment, that the lungs often settle down quite nicely and quite quickly. Uh, and to the degree that sometimes my respiratory colleagues say, oh no, everything's fine, I don't need to see you anymore. Uh, and then <laughs> I have to keep a check on the lungs myself then, which is a bit complicated. But um, uh, so the, uh, most people have um, uh, both conditions. I'm so sorry to interrupt you again, Desmond. I think we're running a little bit behind now, so I think we're going to have to draw um, the questions to a close, but we will try and answer everything um, online. <laughs> um, thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful talk, and thank you, Avril, for sharing your experiences.